What do you think makes a great quilt? What do you think makes a, a really great quilt? The question, one of the questions I know we want to get to is, in your opinion, what makes a good quilt good or a great quilt great? So what grabs you with a great quilt? Uh, what do you think makes a, a really great quilt? What do you think makes a great quilt? Welcome to Season 2 of Running Stitch, a QSOS podcast brought to you by the Quilt Alliance with generous sponsorship from the Robert and Artist James Foundation. I'm your host, Yannickan Smucker. In today's episode, we will unpack one of the most asked questions in the Quilter's SOS Save Our Stories oral history collection. What makes a great quilt? With a guest who has likely seen tens, if not hundreds of thousands of historical American quilts, and has found something great about nearly every one of them. I began studying and researching quilts in a formal sense in 2001 when I started a master's degree in textile history at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. My first course was what back then was called a correspondence course. It wasn't even online. The university mailed me a thick spiral-bound book of duplicated articles and a VHS tape of lectures by noted quilt scholars. One unit Depression-era quilts and kit quilts was presented by today's guest, Mary Kay Waldvogel, whom to those of you interested in quilt history will need no introduction. As I continued studying quilts, I attended my first annual meeting of the American Quilt Study Group, and there I met Mary Kay and many other of the formative group of women who began studying and collecting quilts in the mid to late 20th century. After watching all those lectures on tape from Mary Kay and others, I was starstruck seeing these experts in person. And today, as I continue my career as a historian, with my own expertise and interest in quilts, my debt of gratitude is enormous. It's because of the generosity, wisdom, and groundwork that scholars like Mary Kay laid that I can do the work that I do. Mary Kay is the author of Soft Covers for Hard Times, Quilt Making and the Great Depression. She co-authored with Barbara Brackman, Patchwork Souvenirs of the 1933 World's Fair, and co-authored with Betts Ramsey, The Quilts of Tennessee, along with countless articles on various aspects of quilt history. Mary Kay, thank you for joining me. I've invited you here today to ask you, what makes a great quilt? Well, I think for me, the, um, it depends on the time of my life. I think my, my answer to that uh, really depends on whether it was the beginning of my quilt career or the middle or the end. It really has evolved. And I remember the, um, the very first quilt I, I purchased just hooked me. You know, I just, I liked it. I saw it in a window and of a it turns out it was an antique quilt uh, shop in Evanston, Illinois. So I thought I was doing something different by putting it up on the wall in my uh, apartment in Chicago. I, it was brown and green. It was, I called it a North Carolina lily. I didn't know that that, or I think I may have even called it a tulip quilt. But I didn't know the name of it. I didn't know who made it. I didn't know how old it was. I didn't know if it was a good deal price-wise or not. I just saw it. I'm, I remember that morning so distinctly. It just it just grabbed me. And I, I walked in and I said, that quilt in the window, could I see it? And she took it out. She put it in my hands and I said, I'll take this. And I walked home. It was a small quilt. I walked home under with it under my arm and I put it up on I put Velcro on the back of all things. And so, I mean, I think back to that quilt and to me that at that moment, that was the greatest quilt I, I, uh, I ever seen. And I, it was, it was better than anything. I, in my mind, I, that this image I had of a quilt. Um, but as the years went on, so I think about the next two or three years when I was buying quilts like crazy, I realized I had paid more, too much money for that one. And I could get things a lot cheaper 
um, and I loved, I just loved them. I loved the fabrics. The more fabrics, the better. And I really liked log cabin quilts. And I remember um, putting them on the wall and like putting an ironing board up in front of that and ironing and just, I mean, I, I would just look at this quilt and see different things every time. And that, I mean, the more, the more fabrics, the better, I thought. And I like the graphic nature of them. So then when I, that for a sailboat quilt I found in uh, Knoxville, um, I'd moved to Knoxville and oh my gosh, it looked, it looked modern. It looked, it was again, a small quilt. It didn't have all the, it was a quilt. It was three, it was really two layers. It didn't have a, a any batting in it, but I think because it was different, I thought, ooh, I really like this. And I began to want to know the story of these quilts. And this particular one had a, um, a, a, a government stamp in one corner. And I, I figured that there was a paper trail to this quilt. It was a WPA quilt. And oh my, I just, I ended up owning that quilt and it took me just everywhere and it was it, it took me down many many rabbit holes rabbit holes that I ended up driving to this is before the internet I remember going to the you the archives in uh, Washington DC and going through that front little door and you know they look in your box and the, and then you go down into this room and they I had I told them what I was looking for somehow I knew that there was some some records there and they brought down boxes of records that had never hadn't been opened now it turns out it was 1940 so this was 40 years earlier but and there was not no one had gone through these boxes and here I was it was like being an art archaeologist I guess the better story you know the deeper I had to go um, that made a great quilt I think the really the great quilts I've seen over my 40 year career are ones that um, have many layers of greatness. And, um, you know, if I can find information and a photo about a, the person, the woman or whoever who made the quilt, who designed the quilt, and then something about the, the quilt itself, maybe the pattern, the source of the pattern, the, the company that made the pattern, when it was made, I feel like the more information, the closer you get to the truth, I guess that's the, the greater the quilt story is. And then I have to say that just a quilt that's totally anonymous still is a, is a great quilt because so, there's people put things into their quilts that just, uh, and, and you have, and the receiver, a quilt is a, is a gift from someone to someone else, maybe hundreds of years down the the road. You know, and I sleep under quilts. Uh, we really, we both of us, my husband and I both really adore quilts. And um, even the, the scrappy ones, uh, and I was saying that um, I do a lot of quilt sharings at quilt shows and uh, bed turnings. And I often ask people maybe to bring in their quilts. And sometimes it's uh, sight unseen. I don't know what I'm going to get, kind of a potluck of quilts. And um, my friends who are the volunteers always kind of shake their head and say, oh, Mary Kay, you can, you can find something great in every single quilt. And I think that's true. I think that you make, I, I think it's important for the owner of the quilt to know that they've got something special, even if they don't realize it. I pulled some clips from some of the QSOS interviews, now digitized and archived with the Quilt Alliance's partner, the Louis B. Nunn Center for Oral History at the University of Kentucky Libraries. In these excerpts, the interviewees respond with their own answers regarding what makes a great quilt, and I asked Mary Kay to listen back to these with me. First, we listen to quilt designer and author Roberta Horton, interviewed in 1999 at the International Quilt Festival by volunteer Marilyn Geary. 
This interview coincided with an exhibit of the 100 Best American Quilts of the 20th Century, a fitting topic for discussing what makes quilts great. What do you think makes a great quilt? A great quilt. Well, I think you have to, to be attracted to it when you see it from afar, in most cases. I mean, that's one way that it pulls you over. I think it has to require you a long time to look at it. So I like quilts that have a lot of fabric in them. If it's just a two-fabric quilt, it would be very difficult for it to be a great quilt for me. Because I like the workmanship. I'm very interested in the workmanship. And so if it had superb quilting on it and superb piecing and applique, but it was only two colors, it would not be a great quilt to me. I want to take a long time to be lost within that quilt. And it has to be such that I can also not memorize everything that's in that quilt, so that when I see that quilt again, I'm equally excited. Some of the ones that are in the great, the hundred quilts I've seen over the years, some of them many years ago, and it's a thrill to see them again. And I was seeing things in them that I didn't remember. And even Judy Matheson's Mariner's Compass, which I've seen how many times and how many pictures, when you see it up close, you're forced to look at all the different fabrics that she used, which in the photograph, a large photo, or a you know, small photograph, you might think the entire quilt is made with solids. So that I still was forced to read the entire surface of the quilt. That's what I'm interested in. So I think Roberta seems to share your love of like the, all of the fabrics. Um, what else do you find compelling about her answer? Well, I know that she was there at the time of the uh, 100 best quilts of the 20th century. And I was one of the judge, one of the people got to choose uh, those quilts, not the final round, but, um, and I remember having to choose those. You know, we knew that these were going to go down in history. I don't know that they really have, but we felt like the top 100 quilts really ought to be something special. And she talked about Judy Matheson's quilt with all those pieces in it. I remember once at the er, one a, an early AQSG meeting back when we met in California, Judy was sitting in the back of the room putting that quilt together. I was overwhelmed. I thought, wow, you know, there are people, you know, I see it being put together. It became a really famous quilt. And I do relate to her aspect about the overall impact of a, a quilt, to see it from afar. And I think that's what I was saying about the quilts of Tennessee when we were choosing the quilts. Again, we knew that these were going to be in a book and in a, an exhibit. And, you know, you, you, you think of it, a quilt has to be big at, from afar imagine walking into a gallery and then coming into it and get close to it and uh, be intimate with the quilt and look at those fabrics. Next, we listen to Alice Robinson, a quilt maker from Texas, interviewed for QSOS in 2001 by Kay Jones. Uh, what do you think makes a great quilt? Well, I guess really uh, uh, is is truly planning it out and, and uh, having just the right materials to go in each block. If you're gonna make a, uh, a pieced block or an applique block, I think that the materials and the planning is what really makes a quilt. Have you won some prizes, Alice? Yeah. Uh, now this quilt, uh, I won uh, best of show at Bowie and uh, at Chico. It, it re I received best of show and uh, a, a first place ribbon. It. Was Bridgeport? I I have a whole box of ribbons. <laughs> oh, in Saginaw. Yeah, Saginaw. Mm. At their training grain festival. Oh. 
Well, that must be very, very satisfying to know yeah. that other people appreciate your quilts. It's really exciting. What do you think makes a, a great quilter? Well, I don't know what makes a great quilter. I guess uh, I always thought of uh, Aunt Emma as being a, a great quilter because she she always uh, had quilts uh, going some some way. It might be in the piecing stage, or she had a quilt going all the time. She never did sit with her hands idle. When she Aunt Beatrice was quilting on her quilts, she picked out the the uh, quilting because she said that uh, you could hang your toe in her quilt. <laughs> So um, what do you like about Alice's perspective? <laughs> well, I mean, let's get down, you know, get down to what quilting really is. Let's, you need enough fabrics, you need planning, you need stitches, you need time, you just keep at it, you keep at it. I mean, that in her, in her, that is it, you know, you have to get them finished. You're not, a, <laughs> you're not going to have a good quilt or a great quilt or be a unless it's finished. <laughs> and I mean, that is, you know, we can talk in these kind of esoteric terms about this and that, or we could be observers, but they are, you know, quilting comes from, they're a really basic level. And then I love the fact, Alice probably had won a lot of prizes. She has a whole box of ribbons. <laughs> a whole box of ribbons, yes. And she was probably a great quilter, you know, and she was being, she was being humble. She wasn't going to tell you. She probably in her mind thought, well, I am the best quilter in my family and I, I win ribbons around here. I should, she was, I think she was just being humble. And um, I just, I love that answer because that, oh boy, I, I just adored getting to know that's the way my entree was talking to people and hearing those stories you know one to one i just uh, i felt really privileged to that felt like an authentic answer a really authentic answer So I, I do know that um, you, like me, as, have used oral history as one of the ways to learn about quilts. Um, why do you think it's important um, to actually get a chance to speak to quilt makers? Uh, well, there are several reasons. First of all, I just, I, I, I was doing it in the beginning to record what they said because I knew I wasn't going to remember all of it. And that was in the beginning, that's what I did. And I love to go back to those tapes and it brings it all back where I was then, what they said, if you can capture firsthand accounts or contemporaneous accounts of close to when that object was created or owned or used, it just adds to the, the value, I think, of the, uh, of the object. Next, we listen to Ellie Sinkiewicz, also interviewed at the 1999 International Quilt Festival in Houston. She's an expert in making Baltimore album style quilts, uh, a 19th century reproduction. Here, Bernie Herman asks her what makes quilts great. I think that at the end of the 20th century, our tendency has been to focus on judging measurable things in a quilt. That is, there has been, for the past two decades, I'd say, a, a uh, procedure almost of judging quilts by different things, color, overall appeal, stitching, getting down to very detailed things like whether the corners lie flat, if you fold it up, whether they're even. And I agree that that leads people to higher levels of workmanship and teaches them. But I'm also a maven of the auctions, and I watch these quilts. Well, I watch album quilts. One sold for 176,000, resold for 200,000, one sold for 264,000 a couple of years ago. And these are not quilts that are uniformly, exceptionally well made. 
That is, on, if you were judging purely by measurable things, they wouldn't do so well. But if you tried to assess magic, <laughs> that is, whether in fact they were a window to someone's soul, whether you looked at it and it brought tears to your eyes, or whether, uh, as with many of the album quilts, it brought back a particular time and place, a sense of history or a sense of the person that made it. I think that makes a great quilt. And when somebody's hitting on all cylinders, when they can do it well, but their spirit's free, so that they're not making something like the other one, and they, they put an unspoken passion into it, and I think you've got a great quilt. So you can walk over to the 100 Best and look at them and see if you feel that with some of the quilts. And I think you'll feel it with a lot of them. And I think that quilt makers never say this, but they know that it's their earthly immortality, that, that they will speak to people yet unborn and someone will respond, someone will understand it because we all feel sure that in another 150 years, there'll be another revival. <laughs> What are your thoughts about um, Ellie's reaction? Well, that, that statement about immortality kind of ties into the importance of documenting your quilts and uh, also to the oral histories that I took. The, um, you know, I, if you put your name on a piece of cloth or something on the, on the back of a quilt that you've made or you've owned, put the, we talk about it all the time at the Alliance. Um, it, I guarantee you it'll be around longer than, than it normally would because if somebody's name is on it or a date, uh, that's why those album quilts, um, I think, especially the signature quilts have lasted so long. You, it's hard to throw something out if there's, or even wear it out um, if there's a name and a date on it. So. Uh, yes, I think it. It's you're you're assuring your immortality, and um, the the fact that women didn't really have a chance to make their mark any other way, uh, but here through their their work, their quilts, and in fact, what she said about um, other needlework, um, they can assure us uh, at least a semblance of immortality, <laughs> a remembrance, longer than maybe. Uh, you would have otherwise. And then that um, about recording this, you know, I, I do think that um, recording stories, recording those interviews has given, our, 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 the longer it goes on, right now some of those uh, interviews I did 30, 40 years ago, they gain uh, importance very quickly. And I do think it's really uh, important if you could record board aspects of um, the quilt makers' lives and their importance of that quilt to them. To, uh, to them. I, I totally agree. I mean, many of us who study quilts, we, we have to do so much guesswork and we imagine why this quilt might have been important to its maker, but hearing it from the person mm -hmm. makes such a huge difference. I wanted to close my conversation with Mary Kay, having her recount some memories of her good friend and quilt collector and philanthropist, Linda Clausen, who died in August 2020. First, let's listen to Linda recall in her 2002 QSOS interview, first meeting Mary Kay. How do you think um, quilts have special meaning in women's history in America? I remember when I first met Mary Kay Wolbogle. She and Betts Ramsey had a quilt day of some sort in Knoxville. Uh, at the time, Mary Kay was at the Knoxville Women's Center. And they scheduled a day where they asked people to bring in quilts, either quilts that they had made or quilts that were in the family. And I had two quilts that had been in my family. And interestingly enough, they were exactly alike. How did they do that? My mother did that. Uh, they were uh, part of the Marion Whiteside Cheever Little Women quilts that were in uh, Ladies Home Journal. Mother made two twin size quilts for my bed. I brought one of them in, and Mary Kay thought that was just fabulous. And I thought, whoa, <laughs> this is a surprise. I'd never met anybody who really, you know, was that excited about it. And I also, in the side of my head, had the feeling 
maybe a prejudgment or something, that, that quilts were a feminine expression. Well, somewhere along the line, I, I was thinking about my older son. You tend to deal with your kids. And I, I knew I couldn't make him a Dutch doll or a little women quilt, but I did find a tractor quilt pattern. So uh, it began to develop that I realized that quilting was a whole wide vocabulary of designs and expressions. And I, I think, to me, it is really intriguing that women all over the world have an affinity for uh, fiber work one way or another. And I, I think that common thread, so to speak, that goes through it is, is just really fascinating. Uh, I'm sort of skipping around a whole bunch of things. But it's quite a run. Uh, but at any rate, I became interested in Betts and Mary Kay. And, and those of you who know them realize what kind of a wonderful presentation they make. And I thought, wow, this is really good. And at that time, the Quilts of Tennessee project was coming on, and AQSG was in Gatlinburg, and it was just a whole new doorway opening to me. I didn't feel quite so silly as some of my family and friends thought I was when I was making those quilts. So that was a beginning. I was fortunate to find a, a guild that I enjoy, even more fortunate, a group of women who meet every week, Thursday B. And we've had uh, experiences over a period of 20 years that have been truly, truly rich. Uh, there are four of us at this point who are now, I guess you would call charter members, which sounds scary, uh, but we have wonderful women who come and are part of our experience uh, doing all kinds of fiber work. Can you tell us a little bit about that group? Oh my gosh, it was fabulous. We called ourselves the loose group. Uh, no rules in, with for us now and we there was a guild the smoky mountain quilt guild that started about 1980 i guess so this is and i i probably joined in 82 or 83 and then several of them helped with the tennessee quilt project including linda clausen and this woman named eva earl kent and um, Eva Earl had a, a shop. She st actually started a quilt shop on her own. There were all these people who were being really self-sufficient and doing things, just doing it. And um, so, but her shop was far away from the center of Knoxville and kind of where this, this guild drew from Oak Ridge and Knoxville and South Knoxville. It was a, a wide area. And um so lynn and linda lived near this shop um and so linda said why don't our eva Earl said why don't we start a b these are kind of separate things from the big uh guild and so we did and so it meant that we met every thursday from about i don't know 10 30 to 2 30 we had lunch together and it meant we were sitting around a big table at in the in the midst of this shop and the shop was in her basement and and i really wasn't a quilt maker and but they knew that i was um you know we did this state quilt project and so i was traveling around and on the weekends i'd come back and i'd tell them about what had happened what and then he it went on for another uh 10 or 15 years eva earl died very kind of young too but oh my gosh they just loved hearing mary Kay's stories and um i love telling them and it was like you know just come and tell us where you've been so uh one day i told the story about walking into this department store nearby at the shopping center and there were these quilts in plastic packages that said they were american made quilts but these were the quilts that were being made in china and I could not believe it. I mean, I was so naive, I guess, at the time. And then we heard about the Smithsonian quilts. Linda's husband, who was a uh, attorney in town, and he said to her one night, after she was relating my story to him over dinner, he said, you know, Mary Kay, uh, Linda, you ought to all just grow up and hire yourself a lobbyist and just go talk to them. Forget these petitions and all this stuff, just, to, you know. Well, Linda told me, and I said, well, how do we do that? He said, she said, we're going to start 
<laughs> group. We started a group called the American Quilt Defense Fund. There were four of us, I think, who were signed on as the directors, and we each put in some money, and um, we got some of other people to put in money, and we, we did. We hired a lobbyist that, that Pete knew, and the purpose of that lobbyist was, was simply to open the door to allow us to go visit and speak with the secretary of the Smithsonian. We walked across the, I'll never forget this, walked across the mall, sat there, and uh, were in that, the castle building, and we were escorted into her office. And it was wonderful because he said, Mary Kay, tell her the story. And I just told her why quilters, she had already seen the, the petitions and they were upset that, so, that they'd gotten this bad press, but I just quietly told them why I was upset. So here I'd gone from the local department store guy to the undersecretary of the Smithsonian. And when I explained to her what really upset most of the people was this Harriet Powers quilt, this icon made by an African-American woman. I said, you know, quilts are duplicated. There are patterns. There's, I mean, that's the nature of quilts. But this particular quilt by Harriet Powers was so unique. And to copy that and sell it for, at the time, it was $150, that really touched a nerve. And she, she reacted. She understood. And she said, basically, well, you know, we've got a contract we have to fulfill. What do you think we should do after that? And I said, well, let's just stop it with these, whatever it was, five. It was a, not a lot of, of their quilts that they had licensed to this company in, to reproduce. And I said, when that contract's over, I said, you know, don't do it again. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation, Mary Kay, and I am sure our listeners will as well. Um, it's rare to get to hear some hear from someone who has seen, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm sure you probably hesitate to even put a number on it. How many quilts do you think you've seen? Tens of thousands. <laughs> easily, easily, I'm sure. Um, well, thank you for thinking back about what makes them great. And uh, thank you for listening back to some of these interview clips with me as well. It's been a pleasure to speak with you today. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, Yannick. Running Stitch Season 2 will take a brief holiday break, but that's a perfect time for you to listen back to episodes from Season 1. If you are enjoying Running Stitch, consider making an end-of-year donation to sponsor a QSOS interview as we continue to work towards making the entire oral history collection of over 1,200 interviews digitally searchable at our website. A quilt interview sponsorship makes a great holiday gift for that quilt fanatic in your life. Through the end of 2020, all gifts will be matched by an angel donor. Visit qsos.quiltalliance.org to explore interviews and make a donation today. Running Stitch, a QSOS podcast, is a project of the Quilt Alliance, a member-supported national nonprofit dedicated to documenting, preserving, and sharing the stories of quilts and quilt makers. Running Stitch is hosted and written by me, Yannick and Smucker, and I serve as co-producer with QSOS project manager, Emma Parker, with support from Quilt Alliance executive director, Amy Milne. This podcast is generously funded by the Robert and Artist James Foundation. QSOS Oral History Interviews are archived with our partners, the Louis B. Nunn Center for Oral History at the University of Kentucky Libraries and at the Library of Congress American Folklife Center. You can listen to full interviews and see photos of quilts at our website, qsos.quiltalliance.org. Running Stitch features music by Chris Ezelgroth, accompanied by a singer featherweight, and Amy's Best Sewing Shears. <laughs> <laughs>